Now, I'm not sure about y'all, but there are some times in life where I feel like it's important for us to be able to identify, to be able to, to discern what, what are the certain marks of a thing, what are certain ways that this exactly is this and not that, that you know that this is safe and this isn't safe, that this is a good deal or this is a better deal. Again, there are certain times where it's just it's really important to know, like, what are things that you should be looking for? In particular, again, I'll give you a couple examples that I could find. Some of them very random that you may not run into, and some of them might be more practical. But take, for example, like a coral snake. For those who may know, coral snakes are extremely venomous. But at the same time, there's another snake called a king snake, which is mimicking it, and it's completely harmless. So, I mean, it'll still bite you. It's just not going to kill you. But anyway, this is where you hear that famous mnemonic. Uh, I, I'm going to read it because I want to tell you the wrong one just by happenstance. Uh, red and yellow, kill a fella. And red and black, friend of Jack. Again, it's the whole idea that, again, if you see a snake that has red and yellow colors touching, generally, that's going to be a coral snake. And if you get bit by it, you could potentially die. But the color that's very similar, if it's red and black that are touching in this case, then that's a king snake. And again, I mean, you shouldn't go play with it. But I mean, at least you're not going to die if it bites you. At the same time, again, we have a lot of tech products. Again, I know a lot of us tend to research and, and look into it um, and see which one we want to buy or which one we like. But there's always kind of that fear of like, well, if I buy something online, am I going to get like the real one? Especially like with Amazon, am I going to get the real one or am I going to get a counterfeit one? So you always kind of want to know, like you can look through the reviews, you can look through Google, you can look through YouTube and you can see people say like, well, if it's the real one, you can see there's this thing on it. You'll see this logo here or, or the battery compartment looks different on the fake ones or something. So you're always kind of looking like, what are the marks that tell you that this is authentically the product you're looking for? Or again, another one that we come across, um, if you're at the grocery store and you're trying to pick out fruit, like you want sweet fruit, right? You don't want the plain, you don't want to just bite into nothing. So you're trying to figure out, like, how do I know which fruit is good? Now, I can't go through every single piece of them with you, but some common ones, again, for example, if you pick up a cantaloupe, when you smell it, you should smell the sweetness come out of the cantaloupe. If you're looking at oranges, they should be firm, kind of soft, very brightly colored. If they're dark, kind of brown and dirty, again, you probably want to avoid those particular ones. And last one I could think of and just things that we're trying to look at and see are like talking about used cars, right? When you're looking at a used car, you want to see like how many miles does the car have on it? Does it have any dents or visible scratches? Does it make weird sounds when you're driving? Does it, you know, make, uh, again, does it shudder? Does it feel funny while you're moving with it? These are signs that, again, you should probably avoid or potentially even buy this car, depending on, again, what are the marks that reveal itself to you as you inspect it, as you're looking through it. And like I said, there are so many times in life where it's important for us to be able to identify what's good and what's not good. And I think this is where Paul is bringing us to here as we continue through our series of, of gospel shift. And particularly, he's not going to tell us what does it mean, like what are the signs, what are the marks that you want to look for to see what is a good minister. And looking at this idea of, again, how the gospel shifts us, he starts telling us a little bit about himself, and he starts telling us, what are the characteristics, what are the things that you want to see out of somebody who is a good minister? Is that person funny? Are they responsible? Are they fairly authoritative? Do they take action when it needs to be done? Are they charismatic? Do they hold good presence when they're on the stage? Are they honest? Are they creative? I mean, I could keep naming characteristics about myself, but I just felt like, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not that big of a deal, but... Um, again, like these, these things that you want to see, like what are the marks of a minister that make a good minister versus ones that make a bad one? What is somebody who could potentially help save souls versus somebody who would potentially lose them? And so again, we've been going through this series as we've been going through the book of Romans, this letter that was written to the Romans. And we are now on the back end of chapter 15. And it's crazy to think about that we've got maybe three, four more messages and we'll be done with the book of Romans here. But so far, again, Paul has been going through and he's been showing us that we are to love one another, right? That as the gospel shifts us, as the gospel transforms our lives, we're called to love one another. In fact, we're also called to outdo one another in honor. That when you show love on somebody else, when you honor somebody else, you're constantly fighting to show like, how can I love you more than you love me? And they're trying to fight. How can they love you more than you love them? And it should be a battle as fellow Christians that we are continuing to show love to one another. And the last time we got together, he went through this entire argument of how we're free, right? That we have freedom in our convictions. That if you feel like you want to drink, you want to eat meat, you want to get a tattoo, that you're free in the convictions because of the fact that you are free in Christ. But ultimately, you should give up those freedoms if it causes somebody else to stumble, right? And again, if you want to go through that, we have our archive. You can check out our YouTube channel and find all those messages and see exactly what it is that Paul is getting to here. 
But now we dive into the back half of 14. Again, Paul shifts into a new argument. And he's talking about, again, so as we continue to shift in the gospel, what are we to do as we look towards the marks of a good minister? So again, if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 14. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. And Paul reads for us here, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I think in this first section here, it's funny that Paul, halfway through now, he's in verse 14, halfway through chapter 15, which is like 80 to 90 percent through the entire letter of Romans, Paul now tells us, this is why I'm writing to you, right? He waits towards the very back end to actually tell you why is he a minister, right? And it's just kind of ironic because, again, when you look at how they're told, how, how they teach us to write our papers now, they tell you, again, in your first paragraph, you should be identifying, and that's how I generally write my messages. It's what are we doing here, right? What is the thesis? What's the summary statement? What is, what is it that I'm trying to prove to you here this morning? And then you go and you elaborate and you show how all those things happen. But Paul, he goes through the whole diagnosis and the whole, um, again, explanation of what does it mean to be saved by Christ, What does salvation really mean? And here at the end, he says, oh yeah, this is why I've told you all of those things. But as we dive into this, you'll see that Paul has good reason for writing the way that he does. So looking at this verse by verse, here in 14, he says that I am satisfied about you. Some of your your translations, they may say, I am convinced. So again, remember that all of Paul's letters that he's written to, they're all to people that he knows, like Timothy um, and Titus, or he's writing to churches that he's helped plant, like to the church in Ephesus or Philippi or the church in uh, Galatia. So all these churches that he's writing to, they're ones that Paul has planted, except for the church in Rome. Paul has never been to Rome, to the Roman church, rather. He's been to Rome, just not to the Roman church. But Paul still knows people, right? Paul is still connected. He's heard through people that the church in Rome is good, right? He tells them that he's heard that they are full of goodness. He is satisfied. He is convinced of three things that the church has done. That they are full of goodness, they're filled with knowledge, and they're able to instruct one another, right? He's been told that the church in Rome has this reputation of being good to people around them, that they're being kind to those who enter into their church. And they do this because they're filled with the knowledge of who Christ is and what Christ has called them to do. Even to the point where he says, your goodness and your ability to show kindness to others and the fact that you are knowledgeable about what Christ has done, you have proven that you're able to actually go forth and teach other people about what Christ has called us to. It's like if you have that friend who's really good at cooking or sewing or or crafting or whatever it is, and you're like, oh my gosh, like, you're so good at this. Like, you should open up a store. You should be teaching other people how to do this. That's the same compliment Paul is giving to them. You guys, you here in the church of Rome, you have been so good with the gospel. Like you should be opening up a church. You should be running the church. You should be teaching other people, making disciples. And Paul continues and he says here in 15, that even with this good reputation that they have, even though you've had this good reputation, I still have written to you. And not only have I written to you, he says I've written to you boldly. I've written to you with confidence. And I've done this as a way of reminder. All right, and this makes sense because, again, we as humans, we are extremely forgetful creatures. Like, take, for example, like the first thing that we usually do when we jump into Sunday school is we talk about, like, what are your highs and lows of the week? And the first thing that everybody does is, what did I do this week? Like, that just happened seven days ago. And we're all just like, I don't really remember what happened. Like, I, I, what did I do yesterday? Right? We're forgetful instantly of what's going on. Let's talk bigger picture here even. How many of you guys, show of hands, how many of you can tell me exactly what is the quadratic formula? (laughs) I like the two people who raised their hands are the ones probably learning it right now. (laughs) Everybody else, you've either forgotten the quadratic formula or again, if you've learned it, let me even ask, let me take this to another level. Like why do we learn the quadratic formula? Does, Does anybody know why we learned the quadratic formula? Right? Like some of us, we may know it. And for those of you who want a refresher, and again, hopefully I've done this right. Again, I had to research this myself because I've forgotten myself. But the quadratic formula is 2x 
oh, x squared plus 2x, oh my goodness, I, just, I learned this and I forgot it already when I was doing research on this. Again, all to prove, I really wasn't trying to prove this accidentally, but again, it's, it's all to show that we are extremely forgetful creatures. But at least just to give you some info, why we have this quadratic formula is it's through this formula that we're able to calculate, like, in, in sports, if you follow sports and you're a big fan, if you're looking at quarterbacks and they want to see, like, what's the velocity, what's the trajectory of this football that he's about to throw, you use the quadratic formula to calculate that. If you're in engineering, if you're looking at brakes and you're trying to design a car, you need to find out how much stopping power does my car need in order for it to stop from this point to another. That's using the quadratic formula. All these examples, all these things of why we have it, and again, half of us can't remember it. It's the foundation, even, of mathematics. If you look towards anything beyond algebra, it all builds off the quadratic formula, and all of us can't remember it, except for the people who are probably learning it and using it right now. So again, Paul is writing to these people, and he's saying, hey, you have a good reputation. You have been told that you teach well, that you talk well, that you live well, but I'm still writing these things to you because the importance of knowing why Christ came to save us, the importance of knowing how we're supposed to live as followers of Christ, of how the gospel changes and shifts us, this is so important, this is so foundational that I'm writing to tell you again, even if you already know it, you need to be reminded of it. And Paul tells us he does this because it's the grace given to him by God. And so again, Paul finishes up and he, he goes into verse 16 here and he says that he's done all this to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. See, when we look at this, like we look at a couple of different apostles in particular, Peter was always kind of the apostle to the Jews. He was a Jew himself, grew up that way, and he always had a way with talking with them. But Paul, whenever he entered, he was a Jew himself, but he always entered into the places and he always had trouble trying to speak to the Jews. Not that he didn't speak well, but he just didn't connect well with them. And so the people who always accepted and the place where he always had the biggest impact was actually with the Gentiles. And so Paul says, I've basically been a minister to the Gentiles. And I do this as a service to the gospel of God so that ultimately the offering of the Gentiles can be sanctified, can be, be justified, can be holy through the Holy Spirit. See, what Paul is writing to us here is that he's telling us that ultimately this is his ministry. That as a minister of Christ Jesus, he acts as a priest. And for us, again, in the New Covenant, in a sense, us in the New Testament church, we don't really think that way because we don't really think of priests. But ultimately what the priest was for was the priest was there to facilitate on behalf of the people and say, like, this offering that you bring to God, is it a good offering? If it's not, then you need to go look for another one. But if the offering that you're bringing forth is good, then we'll take it and we can give it to God. That was one of the primary duties of the priest, was to make sure that the offerings given by the people were good. And so Paul is saying, this is my role. I've been a minister of Christ Jesus, and you, you have been my ministry, and I am offering you to Christ. And the reason why I've written this letter, the reason why I've told you things that you may have already known, the reason why I'm reminding you of things that you may have already been told it's because I want to make sure that when you offer yourself up as living sacrifices to God, that you are a good sacrifice, that you are a good offering. And so all this is this, the foundation, because we need to understand that Paul, as somebody who's going to tell us what is a good minister, he says that I myself am a minister, that I myself am one who has been ministering on behalf of Christ Jesus. And so what he goes into next here in these couple of verses are two, I think, very fundamental things that every minister needs to be doing. So let's read through 17 all the way to the first part of verse 19 here. And Paul says, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and the wonders of the powers of the Spirit of God. And let me pause there, and again, I'll pick up the back half of that in the next point here that we look at here in a second. But the, the mark that Paul brings us to here first, he says the first thing that you want to look at as a mark of a good minister is that they are boastful in the Lord. The person who is a good minister is somebody who speaks vastly and who speaks frequently about what God has done. See, in verse 17, Paul says that in Christ Jesus, I have reason to be proud, that it's all the work that he's done, everything that he's accomplished to this very point, every church that he's planted, every miracle that he's done has been an offering to God. And ultimately, again, it's because of Christ, it's because of God that he is proud of his work. 
And then he continues in verse 18. And he says, for I will not venture to speak of anything except of what Christ has accomplished. Right? That Paul wouldn't even bother speaking anything, any of these words. He wouldn't bother writing a single thing down if it wasn't because of what Christ has done through him. That all the glory, all the accomplishments he has, all of it is because and through Christ. And then finally, at the end of 18, going into 19, he starts giving examples. Let me go back, actually, real quick. He says the the first thing of ways that he has ministered and boasted in God is by word and by deed. The fact that we're reading this letter, this is Paul boasting about God. He is writing through word about everything that God has done. And then he talks about the deeds. If you look through Acts, you can see all kinds of things that Paul has accomplished, all the miracles that he's done, that he's healed people. He has casted out demons. In fact, my favorite one of Paul casting out demons comes from Acts, I think, 16, if I'm not mistaken, where this demon is constantly pestering Paul. And he cast out the demon out of annoyance, basically. Like, you keep bothering me, so demon, be gone. Right? That seems like such an awesome power to have, right? You cut me off. Demon, be gone. You know, like, it's just a cool thing to have. But again, it's not what I'm supposed to be doing. And thank goodness it's not me who has that. But again, that Paul has that. But he does all of these things again, and he says continuously over and over and over that this is all through Christ. By word and by deed, he also continues and he says, by the power and signs of the wonders. Again, all the miracles, everything that he's accomplished, all of this is by the power and the spirit of God. And I think this is so critical for us to get because I think so often, especially in today's, again, me-centric kind of focus, we kind of talked about that a little bit last week, But even here in our church, not I shouldn't say our church, but here in the church, I should say, this is such a a pandemic thing that's happened to us. It's so easy for us to get caught up in thinking like this is about me. Right? You sometimes hear uh, people in charge of ministries. They get so offended. We're like, they ask, they ask me to step down, but I started this ministry. I'm the one who founded this organization, and they ask me to step down. It's not about you. It's not about who starts it, it's who's finishing it, and that's Christ. I can give you a really good example that I experienced myself. I was working uh, with another organization, and I was running sound. We had a big worship night. We had several bands coming in and out. Again, big groups, really like professional people, people who were getting paid to play at other churches, at other groups and whatnot. And had one of them, he came up to me, and he was like, hey, like, I I can't hear myself in, in the house. Like, I know I'm not loud enough. Like, I need you to turn me up, because if I can't be heard, then, like, what's the point of me even playing? And I was just taken aback because I'm sitting here like, I'm just a volunteer. I'm just chilling. But I thought the whole point of us doing worship was to give God glory. Like, it's not about me being heard. It's not about what I can play and how well I can play it. It's about the fact that I give glory to God for it. Like, I can tell you specifically on behalf of our praise team, I know each and every one of them. I know where their heart is. And their purpose in playing and leading us in worship isn't to show you how good they are. It's not to show off their talents and abilities. When I come here and I bring forth a message, my goal isn't to show you, like, oh, I can be super inspirational. I can, be, I can make you enjoy everything that I'm talking about. No, the point of what we do here from the start of our service to the finish of our service and all throughout the week, everything our church is going for is to glorify God, is to give him the praise. And it's sad that, again, this is what's happened in our society, in our culture, that even in our churches, people will get upset when they tell me to step down. That, again... I don't know what God has in store for me. I really have no idea. If we're here for 10 years, that's awesome. If we're here for 50 years, that's awesome. If he tells me to move to California or to New York, or or God forbid, if he tells me to go to Dallas, I mean, I'm going to go where God calls me to, and I'm not going to be upset. If this church came over and said, we need you to step down because there's somebody better fit for this position, then praise be to God that y'all found somebody better. It's not about what I do, but it's what God does through each and every one of us. And the faster that we recognize that it's by God's glory and not through what we do, the more not only does the church grow, but the gospel goes forth and is proclaimed throughout the world. And so the first thing that we recognize is, again, a good minister is somebody who doesn't boast in what they do, but they boast in what God has done through them. And so in the back half of 19 here, Paul continues and he leads us into the last thing I want to get into today. He says, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. 
I think the second thing and the last thing that Paul shows us as a mark of a good minister is that they have a heart for the lost. Somebody who ministers well, somebody who is, is again, carrying the gospel, as somebody who wants to take the gospel to those who don't know it. So again, looking at the back half of 19, again, Paul talks of, again, how he's taking things from Jerusalem to Illyricum. And basically, Paul is saying, like, in all the lands that I've traveled, he's kind of saying, and in another way we could say, like, hey, I've been from California to New York. He's saying, I've been to all these different places, and everywhere that I've been, I have constantly been preaching and proclaiming the word of God. And it's not to say, like, well, that means that all the work is done. In the same way that, again, if we said, I've been from California to New York, you're not saying, like, oh, so you've been in every single city. No, you understand that he's just saying he's been from one place to another. Every place that he has been in, he has continued to preach and to proclaim God's word and all that he does. And then Paul continues here in verse 20, and he says that he has been on this mission, he has been on this purpose with his ambition to preach the gospel, specifically, not just to, to the world that he's been in, but specifically he wants to preach the gospel to places where Christ has not been known. In fact, this is probably why Paul hasn't been to Rome yet, why he hasn't returned to the church in Rome, because he knows the church in Rome is doing well. I don't need to go there is what he's saying. I want to go to the places where Christ is not known. I want to go to the places where Christ has not, has not yet been laid in a foundation. I want to build places. I want to plant churches. I want to see Christ be made known throughout all the land. And then finally, in 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah 52, and he says, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. And I think what Paul is doing here, as he quotes, he does a lot of different things with this particular passage, but I think the biggest one that he does is he shows us that this is what God had deemed right from the very get-go. From the very beginning, Paul's intention, or God's intention, rather, was that God's word, Christ, would be proclaimed to all the world. Isaiah 52 is a prophetic uh, saying from Isaiah talking of Christ. It's talking of the suffering servant specifically. And he's saying that those who haven't heard of him will hear. And those who haven't seen him will understand. All these things come together. He's saying that I am here. My name, Paul, I am coming forth to bring forth the gospel so that those who haven't seen will hear. Those who haven't heard will understand. That's Paul's purpose. That's Paul's intention of what he wants to do here. And I think what Paul has started in proclaiming the ministry of Christ is something that we continue to this very day. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what's called the 1040 window. The 1040 window is this particular, if I've got this right, latitudinal uh, directions. That top one there is the 40 degrees north, and the bottom one there is the 10 degrees north. And that little rectangle, that's where approximately 50% of the world's population lives in. In this little area, we have about 50% of our population. And of this 50%, 86% of it, as of right now, don't know Christ. 86% of 50% of the population. So to give you a hard number, that's about 3.4 billion people who don't know Christ. I think this is the world that Paul would want to go to. When Paul says that I have a desire to take the name of Christ where it has not been told, he's talking of places like this. And I think, again, Paul starting that ministry is something that we continue to this very day. That our goal here as the English ministry of West Houston, we've talked about, and our goal within the next year is to go not quite there yet. We've we got to take stepping stones, right? We've got we to build into it. But our goal is within the next year to go on a domestic mission trip. Somewhere within the U.S., we want to go and proclaim the name of Jesus. We want to go and and continue to experience and show what it means to share the gospel to the people here that we at least culturally understand. And then my goal, just as the pastor right now, is hopefully within the next three years that we would partner with our Vietnamese ministry or other churches and we would take the gospel internationally. Maybe that's to South America, maybe that's to Australia, maybe that's to Canada, I don't know, somewhere outside of the U.S. And then hopefully within the next five years, somewhere, anywhere, we're sending a team to this 1040 window, that we can continue to proclaim the gospel to people who have not heard of who Jesus is. That's our purpose and our call as members of church. And ultimately, the main thing that I want you to take away from is to understand that when Paul says that these are the marks of a minister, that we're all ministers. That I'm not the only minister up here just because I'm on the platform and I'm helping to teach. This is a gift that God has given me. But we are all ministers of the gospel. Looking at what first Peter says, he tells us that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are priests. You are ministers. 
part of this holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, of God, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Paul has told us these are the things that make a good minister, and Peter has told us that each of us are ministers. And so, in, if you can pause that music, I didn't mean to start that right now. I was just trying to get to a black screen there. But um, again, I think the things that we can kind of take a look at from here is, again, first and foremost, what we have to do is we need to pray. Pray for this 1040 window. Pray for the people who are on site right now doing ministry there, who are trying to break into this world, and they're trying to share the gospel to a place that has not heard the gospel. They're trying to share the gospel to a place that doesn't even want the gospel to be shared to. There are places in that window where if you openly share the gospel, you can be arrested, where you can even be killed. So pray for the people who are there on site right now trying to break ground and trying to, again, continue to share the gospel where it has not been shared. And secondly, pray for our church here. That again, as we continue to develop and build out our plan for how we can continue to minister and to mission to our country and the rest of the world. And pray for us that whoever is called to that, whoever continues to serve in that way, that again, God would use us and, and allow us to glorify him through him. But again, more particularly in looking at you guys right now, you guys are ministers of the gospel. And the question needs to be, who do you need to boast of God to? Who do you need to tell of what God has done in your life? Is it the people that you work with? Is it your friends there at school? Is it your neighbors? Is it your family? Who is it that needs to hear of what Christ has done in your life? Who is it that needs to hear the boasting of what God has done? See, mission work doesn't require us to travel thousands or even hundreds of miles. That there are people living right next door to you. There are people working with you that need to hear of what Christ has done. And Easter is next week, and we've been making this campaign of, again, who is your one? Who is one person that you can think of that needs to hear the gospel? And I hope you've been able to find one, and if not, again, you have one week to hopefully, again, invite somebody who needs to see what God has done in your life and what God wants to do in theirs. So I encourage you, in this next week, find that one person. Invite that one person that they would come and they would see what Christ has done, how Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for all of us and for them. Have the courage, have boldness, again, to say maybe what they already know, maybe what they've already heard before, but they need to be reminded of. And show the marks of a good minister, of what Christ has done upon you. Continue to show how you boast in his work, not in your own. And continue to show how you, again, you have a heart for those who need to hear the gospel as well. And again, we've all been called to be ministers. We've all been called to serve Christ and to glorify him. And again, we make it our goal here at church, here at West Houston, to, to equip you and to hopefully, again, just give you opportunities in every way, shape, and form that we will continue to go forth and be the gospel to all that interact with us. That we not only share the gospel with those around us, but we grow in depth in our love for Christ. And this is the whole purpose behind the mission statement that we have here at West Houston that we grow our hearts, we grow individually for Christ, and that we grow for the people around us, that this church, the family that we have here, we continue to love on them deeper and deeper, and that we grow our hearts for the world. That as we grow in this order, as we grow deeper into him, outward towards one another, and together we take this gospel to the world, I hope that you continue to feel that call upon you, that you feel the ministry that God has left upon your heart, how you feel this call, this pull, this push that God wants for you and how his ministry, how his gospel needs to go forth. And so with that, let me pray for us. Let me continue just to encourage you again, just in how God has called us. Father, again, we thank you, again, just for continuing to show us what it means to be a good minister. Continue to show us how we are called to be ministers. And continue to show us the perfect example of that, in that you offered Christ on the cross for us. That Christ gave his life the one that he lived perfectly, without sin, without flaw, he gave that life so that we would have an opportunity to enter into the kingdom of heaven with you. And then, Father, you gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us. That as we've been going through the book of Romans, we've read that, again, even when we don't know what to pray, even when we don't know what to say, you, through the Holy Spirit, tell us exactly what we need to pray. And everything that's prayed is prayed perfectly within your will, God. 
through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we just pray that you would continue, again, just to open us up. Would you give us courage? Would you give us boldness? Would you continue to shape us and form us in a way that it can continue to reflect Christ in everything that we do? And Father, again, as we continue to show these marks, as we continue to identify more and more like Christ, that when people see us, when people look at us, they continue to see you through us. Would you continue, again, just to encourage us as we go through that? That sometimes it's not always picking the easiest way out, that it's sometimes not always living in the easiest way, but it's living and it's experiencing life in a way that glorifies you. So would you help us as we go through that and continue to, again, just give us courage and boldness to share your gospel with those around us. And so, Father, again, we thank you just for this opportunity that we've had to be here in this place just to experience your presence, to hear from your word, and again, just continue to grow ourselves in who it is that you are and who you want us to be. So, Father, again, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we do these, and we pray everything. All in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.